And not that there's anything wrong with saying what the materials are, but it's just, that's not the best way to open. That's something that's part of the conversation. So think about it that way. Like, don't lead with these things. You are listening to Thrive by Design, business, marketing, and lifestyle strategies for your jewelry brand to flourish and thrive. Let's get started. Welcome to the Thrive by Design podcast, episode number 55. This is Tracy Matthews, your host today, and I am thrilled to be here, per usual, to talk to you about something that we've been hearing a lot of you struggle with, and that is converting looky loos into buyers, especially at live events. So I was talking with someone the other day and we were having this conversation and I was like, you know, what, what do you struggle with the most in sales? And <laughs> they said to me, I am so annoyed because people say that they love my jewelry all the time. And then, you know, they're sitting there and looking at it and they just don't buy it. They walk away without buying it. And so There could be a variety of reasons why this is happening to you, but I think it's a really common thing that you're sitting maybe at a live event or you're talking to someone and they're commenting on the jewelry that you're wearing and they tell you that they love it. They're like, your jewelry's amazing. It's so beautiful. I I love all those pieces you're wearing. I mean, it happens to me every day. Like people obsess over this one ring. And then when it comes time to like maybe transitioning that conversation, whether it be an actual conversation like at a sales event or you're just talking to someone live, you know, it gets a little tricky and they just say they like it and then the next step never happens. So today I wanted to talk to you about some of the reasons why that could be happening for you. Then I'm going to give you a couple of tips on how to start to transition some of those looky loos and turn them or convert them into actual buyers. Now, you have to remember that sales is, you know, there is a strategy behind sales, but it's really an art form. And a lot of the live event sales strategies that you might undertake are really about you getting comfortable having conversations. Now, there are different ways to sell things like, you know, selling online, you know, is a little bit different than selling actually person to person because there is this like actual physical energy between two human beings as you're talking to each other. Selling online, you know, could be dialed down a lot more to strategy and like conversion tools like specifically for that platform. But selling in person is just something so different. So if you are ever, you know, in the position where you're going to have to talk to people live in order to sell your jewelry, regardless if it's at a an actual trade show or event, or trunk show or whatever you want to call it, or whether it's just having conversations with people, I think that this uh, episode is really going to help you out today. Um, And just take away the bits and pieces that actually will work for you and your business. So I'm, I'm getting it started just in a moment, but I wanted to, before we get started, just take a quick word from our sponsor. Today's sponsor is ninadesigns.com. Now, if you're a jewelry designer who's looking for some new creative ways to kind of put together jewelry and make jewelry, you are missing out if you're not already working with Nina Designs. They're really known for their unique jewelry findings and charms and pendants. And I think that they're known for that because Nina is a jewelry designer herself and they've really founded the company on the basis of jewelry designers designing for other jewelry designers. So they make it really easy for you to create really unique product and wonderful pieces that are unique and different and very original. And the other thing that I really like about Nina Designs is that for over 30 years, they have been inspiring beauty and creativity while caring for the planet and having a very strong dedication to fair trade practices, which is, you know, I feel like the buzzword for today, but it's just kind of necessary in business to make sure that you're doing things in accordance to fair trade practices. So if you haven't checked out Nina Designs yet, make sure you go over to ninadesigns.com Nina is so generous that she is offering a very special discount code for the Flourish and Thrive Academy and the Thrive by Design community. You can get $10 off your order. This is a one-time purchase, so you can only use this code once. So if you shop at Nina Designs or are thinking about it, make sure that you go use it right now. And you can grab that by going to ninadesigns.com and entering the code THRIVE at checkout. That's the code THRIVE at checkout. All right, time to go shopping and time to get those designs rolling in. 
All right, we are back. Let's talk a little bit about how to convert those looky loos into buyers, especially when you're talking to people live. So before we dive into some of the do's, I wanted to talk about some of the biggest mistakes I see designers doing. When I first started doing trunk shows and live events, in fact, actually the first way that I used to sell my jewelry was doing these home trunk shows or home parties, as I used to call them. I gather a group of my friends and coworkers or whoever. I was working at Nordstrom. I remember specifically having a, an event at this tiny apartment I was living in in El Segundo when I was still in LA um, after college. And I invited all my friends who I worked with at Nordstrom over and then some of my other friends. And we had this little impromptu home party to sell my jewelry. I probably only even had like 20 pieces at that show. I mean, I was just literally just starting out. This must have been like in the early 90s. And everyone came over. We had wine and I sold a couple of pieces of jewelry. I probably made about $1,000 that night. And I was like super excited because, you know, I sold a, a, a bunch of jewelry to my friends And it was a really fun experience. And, you know, that's sort of like a, you know, warm situation where you're getting people in there who are actually probably like primed to pump to buy, which is a little bit different than meeting people cold in person that you haven't met before. So so even though that's different, I think that there is a correlation between warming up people to get them ready to buy and like primed. And there's a lot of ways that you might be selling your jewelry in person, but I don't want you to think of it as sales. It's really more about having a conversation. So the first thing that I wanted to do was to dive in to some of the don'ts. So if you think about what happens when you're at a trade show or you're at like a craft fair or you're at like a street fair, wherever you're selling your jewelry, even if you're at doing like hosted home parties, let's say your friend's hosting a home party and you don't know the people coming and she's hosting it, she's inviting her friends and you have to focus on warming people up. So the worst thing that you could possibly do is to jump on buyers as soon as they walk on the booth and offer unsolicited information. And here's what I mean by that. So to illustrate this point, I want to tell you about a story. I was walking a vintage jewelry show probably two years ago in New York City. I collect vintage jewelry. I love it. Even if I'm not in the market to buy, I really love to walk the shows because I get a lot of inspiration and I just love, I inevitably end up buying something. But I was walking around this show and like, you know, at these vintage shows, cause it's fine jewelry often, there's a huge range of prices. Like you could probably buy a ring for two to $400, but you could also buy stuff upwards of like $30,000 or more. So I was interested in this piece of jewelry and I was looking at it. I knew it probably wasn't something I was going to buy, but I just, I liked it and I was looking at it. And before the guy even had a chance to say hello, or he didn't even take the chance to say hello, I should say, he told me, he pulled it out of the case and told me the price. And I can't remember, I think he's like, this is $30,000. And I was like, okay, thanks. Thanks for telling me that. Like, I didn't even ask you. And To me, that was like one of the biggest sales turnoffs ever because that assumes like the way he approached that assumes that I potentially couldn't afford to buy it or that that was the only determining factor in my choice to buy. And this is a really great lesson. And I love I've told this story before in different ways, but I love using this illustration of people leading with price and leading with other things, which I'm going to discuss soon, soon momentarily. It makes people feel uncomfortable, like Jewelry is really like a personal purchase and people buy it for different reasons. Like if you're at a wholesale trunk show, they're making the decision as to whether or not the jewelry is a good fit aesthetically for their store. If someone's buying it like actually for themselves, they're making the decision if it kind of falls into their aesthetic. And that's like, that's the first sort of connection piece is like, do I love this piece? Is this going to make me feel good wearing it? And to assume that like price is the driving factor, that's like, that's just an annoyance and it's a huge turnoff. So don't ever leave with price. Like if someone, unless someone asks you, like if you're in a booth and someone's like looking at the prices or looking at the stuff, don't say like, oh, that thing is this price. Also, don't necessarily lead with the materials or what it's made of. That's such a boring opener unless someone is talking to you about the materials. Because I was at a fine jewelry trade show. It was obvious that that was probably some sort of carrot gold and that it wasn't plated or whatever. It's just... It's not cool. And so it's kind of like, duh, I know it's 14 karat gold, or I could, have, I could have guessed that just by looking at it. And not that there's anything wrong with saying what the materials are, but it's just, 
that's not the best way to open. That's something that's part of the conversation. So think about it that way. Like don't lead with these things. You might have to eventually get into pricing and materials and stuff like, like that, but that's not like the first thing that you want to lead with right away. And I'm going to explain what I mean momentarily. A couple of the other things that you really don't want to do are the following. <laughs> you want to make sure that you're not sitting down or checking your phone or complaining about how slow traffic is or looking bored or even leaving your booth unattended. I know sometimes you might have to eat in your booth, but you ha- if you don't have someone to help you, make sure that you try to be discreet. If you have a helper, I would definitely like leave the booth to eat your food. You guys can take shifts so that it's it's not distracting for people because what ends up happening is people walk up, they like what they're doing, what they're, you're doing, and then they don't want to interrupt you because they feel bad and they know that you have just limited time to actually you know, eat or do some of these other things. So, make sure that your attention and your energy is high the whole time and don't be complaining, don't be checking your phone, be focused on the, the matter at hand. So now I want to talk, I wanted to get some of those don'ts out of the way because I think people, like when I was walking around the JA show last week, I saw a lot of people kind of sitting back in their booth. They weren't at the front. They weren't smiling. They were, you know, looking like they were having the worst show ever, which I don't know if that's the case. I mean, a lot of them were doing a great job staying in the front of their booth and looking really excited as well. So uh, kudos to those people. But that sort of thing is really important and you know, people looking at your jewelry really pick up on that energy. So let's talk a little bit more about converting some of these looky-loos into buyers. So first of all, when you're starting conversations with people who are walking up to you in real life, you just want the conversation to flow naturally and you want to be very genuine. So the easiest way to start a conversation with someone that you don't know or someone that you're kind of networking with, let's say you're at a networking event, is to just say hello, first and foremost, and ask them how how they are. Or say, how are you today? Or how are things going? Or comment on something that they're wearing. Just make it like a natural flow of conversation. You can crack a little joke if you wanna have a sense of humor, talk about something that's going on in the space around you. But don't necessarily talk right about your jewelry right away. So that kind of flows into starting a real conversation. I used to love sitting in my trade show booth. You know, I worked in the fashion industry. So when I was doing the accessory circuit uh, and some of these other live events where I would be doing like, let's say, a multi-designer event where I was selling directly to consumers, they were often fashion oriented. So what I would love to do was to comment on people's sense of fashion or sense of style. And it could be anything from commenting on their handbag to commenting on their overall look or something like, where'd you get those? Like, oh my God, I'm obsessed. And then we start a conversation and then they start looking at my jewelry and they're like, ah, I love the jewelry, blah, 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 blah. So use a little bit of small talk to start a conversation. If you're not comfortable with small talk, practice with a friend. A couple of years ago, I wrote a um, blog that actually I turned into a video blog all about um, talking about your jewelry designs without feeling skeezy. So if you want to pop on over to the blog, make sure that you check that out over at flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash blog. And I'll try to put the short link in the notes as well. But Robin and I did a little role playing on how to just talk about your work without feeling weird you know, in casual situations. So, so small talk can really help in a lot of different situations, but especially, you know, at live events or when you're talking with people one-on-one. So the next thing that you want to do is to make sure that you have your pitch down about your work, like your inspiration and stuff. So that if it does come up, you can easily tell someone what you do or talk about the jewelry. So Here's a good example. Like, let's say someone comes up and they're looking at your jewelry and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm obsessed. So I was talking with a designer at the JA show this last week. Her name is um, Ruta. I mean, I have her card right here. I'm going to pull it up. Yeah, her name is Ruta Reifen. It's Ruta Reifen Jewelry. And I'm obsessed with her work. It's so cool. And she recognized me. She ended up walking over like, hey, Tracy, like, how's it going? I'm I'm a huge fan of your podcast and Flourish and Thrive Academy. So I went over there and I, when I was walking the show and looked at her jewelry and I was totally obsessed. I tried a ton of stuff on and I was looking at it 
And we were just having like a natural conversation about the jewelry, about her inspiration, about how she teaches other designers. And like, I'm going to buy a pair of those earrings because I, I loved the earrings that I was seeing. They're so beautiful. But it was just like a really natural conversation and easy to talk about. She sort of talked about her inspiration and that she loves to work with lavender amethyst and lav and uh, sapphires and some of the other and morganite. She was telling me about some of the stones that she likes to work with and sort of her process. And it was just a really natural evolution. I was complimenting her on the jewelry. She took my card so she can follow up. And you have to remember that there's a lot of different ways that you can convert those looky loos into buyers. It's not just necessarily making the sale right at that moment. So I thought that that conversation that we had was a really wonderful, natural conversation about how I was like obsessed with her jewelry, totally beautiful, where I didn't buy right away, but it's probably gonna land in a potential sale. So think about how you can start having conversation and using small talks small talk to sort of inspire like a deeper connection with someone and build a rapport with with whoever it is you're talking to the other thing too is that you can start asking them questions ask them questions about things that they're wearing ask them questions about you know whatever's going on in life or you know make a joke just like get them engaged build a rapport and I learned this sales technique from a friend of mine is that when you're trying to get people engaged and build a rapport with them in a sales call or a sales conversation, you want to get them to say yes as many times as you possibly can. So that's a really good way to connect with them. If you could think of questions that they might possibly answer yes to, that's another great way to build sort of a connection and a rapport with the people you're talking to. So I briefly mentioned this earlier, but you also want to have your pitch down so that you have you feel really comfortable talking about what you do. So you want to have a dial down into three sentences and it really depends on the scenario. So if you're at an event, your three sentence pitch needs to be sort of about like your inspirations and like the materials that you're using and just, it needs to roll off your tongue really naturally and not sound canned. And it could be a little bit different every time, but it needs to sound like it's just something that's rolling out of your mouth. So let's say, you know, if I'm talking to someone and let's say I had a booth and I was showing like a collection of engagement rings that had rose cut diamonds and I, I loved using rose gold. I would say probably say something right now like I'm totally obsessed with rose gold and I love rose cut diamonds. It's been the foundation of my collection from the beginning and I really love the way that the rose gold complements the rose cut diamonds because of the sort of edgier look of the the rose gold as compared to like regular traditional like white gold or yellow gold and also like the different kind of cut of the rose cut diamonds. So that's just like a natural flow for me of something that maybe I would talk about with, that includes sort of inspiration and things that I'm doing in my work. And that's sort of how you can start feeding in like materials into the conversation and talk about, you know, where you got the inspiration from. You know, one of the things that I used to get asked all the time when people were looking at my jewelry was like, how do you get inspired to do all this stuff? And I would tell them, you know, I travel a lot, so I get a lot of inspiration from architecture. You know, things just come to me at times when I'm like practicing yoga or in the shower, and I just have a lot of ideas, so I try to jot them down when I'm sort of dreaming them up. So there's lots of different things that you can infuse in there, but you could just make it sound natural. It doesn't have to sound like so like, my inspirations are nature and vintage jewelry and, you know, my travels from around the world. It doesn't have to be so like, bio-esque it could just be like a natural conversation so the next way to get people looky lose to convert into actually buying your jewelry is to encourage them to try it on in a natural way get it on their body get them to connect with it and get them seeing what it looks like on them also another really great tool that's related to this is like you can sort of like try on and demonstrate the jewelry when you see people looking at something. You don't obviously want to pull it out of their hands, but let's say they're admiring a couple pieces. You could pick it up and just say, oh my God, this is one of my favorites. Like put it on your wrist and be like, look how beautiful it is. Like one of the things that I really love about it is how it sparkles, you know. Do you want to try it on, you know, or something like that. Just kind of encourage them to touch and feel the jewelry and get it on their body because that's going to really get them to connect with the pieces and want to buy. And remember that jewelry is a very, very thoughtful purchase. Sometimes people need to think about it first before they buy it. So if someone walks away, I mean, I just mentioned the story of me hanging out with Ruda and loving her work. And I was like, you know, what? I think I'm going to email her back and like order those earrings that I really loved or one of those rings. 
because they were so amazing. Something that I would love to wear and like sort of mix in with my own jewelry. And I loved it, but I, I wanted to think about it first. It wasn't something that I felt comfortable just buying right on the spot right there. So, you know, thinking about like that a lot of people are like that, finding a mode to be able to follow up with them after. So as you're starting to move along in your sales practice and getting used to having sales conversations, you kind of need to learn how to close the deal, right? So some of that is part of these strategies that you're getting. You're getting them to connect with the jewelry. You're getting them to kind of try it on and touch and feel it and to really feel like it, it belongs, that they should own it. You know, you could do little fun things like, you know, have a little fun conversation. Like, I think you need to have that. That is amazing on you or something like that. Cause that's just like a a fun, like kitschy way to get people to connect and be like, Oh, I think I need to have it too. You have to really feel it out. Like someone might be turned off by something like that, but it could also be like a fun way to connect with them. Also, you need to approach this from a place of service. Like how are you helping them out or how are you solving their problem? You know, like look at what else they're wearing. Like Talk about how well the jewelry that you're making merchandises or works with what they're already wearing. Ask them, once again, ask them questions about the other types of jewelry that they wear so you can connect that. And then you you can slowly convert them into the sale. So one of the things that I like to do when I'm talking to people is to just like share information about how I can help them. And since I do offer sort of a custom service, Talking about the service is really is really like an opportunity to close the sale. And what I mean by that is to naturally just like sort of combat like what their objections might be. We had a really fun scenario at our live event last year. Uh, we host this live event every year. We have one coming up this year in September, September 22nd and 23rd in New York City. Uh, It was originally designed for just our mastermind students, but we've decided to open it up to anyone who would like to go in the jewelry community, who's part of our Flourish and Thrive community. If you're interested in that, I'll I'll link to the show notes, but you can check that out over at flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash live. Anyway, two of our designers, uh, Shoshana is the designer of F is for Frank, and we had um, Ira from Irina Zahn Jewelry. And... We had them role play a little bit. This is one of the things that I love so much about getting people live in the same room when we're trying to teach sales trainings because actually interacting with people is super funny. So we had them just like play around with each other. And one of them was, I think it was, I I think it was Ira who was actually supposedly selling her jewelry. And then Shoshana, or Shoshana, who is sort of like, doesn't like to sell, you know, she gets really uncomfortable selling. She was the person buying. So they, they actually, they flip flopped, I think in both cases, but there was one scenario and I can't remember how it really went, but like the whole story turned into like how Shoshana was like, you know, looking for stripper jewelry and Ira actually did body change. She's like, Oh wow. Well, you know, what's so funny is like my body chains would work really well, you know, for your, your, you know, with your, dance outfit or whatever. So it turned into this really fun conversation where they're role playing, where Ira really had to become inventive and practice how she could help Shauna, who was pretending like she, you know, only wanted to buy things that she could wear while she was stripping. It was just like a, you know, a little bit of a cheeky workshopping thing that we did that was super fun, but it's fun to kind of practice with like playing with objections that people could have. Cause Shoshana was trying to totally throw Ira through a loop and Ira re- reacted really quickly. Like, Hey, I got these body chains. Like these are perfect for your profession. And thinking about like, what are the, some of the objections that people could come up with? Or what are some of the things that you could, maybe you wouldn't think of it in terms of objections, but like how could, what could you suggest of sell to get them interested in purchasing. It doesn't have to be like a pushy thing. It could just be like a fun conversation. And that's sort of like being engaging in that way and really having this real conversation and offering solutions and coming from a place of service about how you can help them with whatever it is that they are looking for or needing at at that time is an interesting way to approach sales. And so, you know, at the end of it, you know, wrapped up and you know, the, the two of them were laughing and I think Shoshana fakely bought the body chain or whatever that Yura had. 
But regardless, and I could be getting the story slightly wrong. It might have been the other way around, but I'm pretty sure that that's how I remember it. But it was so cute. I should find the recording and share it. So cute, but that's like just a, a great way to practice. And so one of the techniques that I recommend for refining your skills is to find someone to practice having these conversations with. It could be friends and family members, and you can have them like come up with a list of objections. You don't want them to tell you at first because you want to practice at coming back on the fly and seeing how you can react and um, comment when someone throws you through a crazy loop when you're trying to sell something. And then workshop it. You know, we have this opportunity at our live event where we call designers up on stage and we do these live interactive workshopping things so that they can get more comfortable selling. Because as Robin likes to say, and like as we always say here at Flourish and Thrive Academy, Revenue coming into your business or sales is really the lifeblood and what continues to keep the cycle of business going. You know, without money coming in the door in one way or another, it's really hard to grow your business. So you need to to make sure that money is consistently coming in with your sales so that you can keep your business afloat and keep your business going. And then the final two strategies that I wanted to talk about really today about converting looky loos into buyers are number one, to make sure that you're listening to what people are saying to you and finding a way to naturally to respond to them from a place of service and helping. So listening is a huge tool in getting people to actually buy from you. Really, really important thing to do. So like, let's say you're having a conversation with someone and she's like, yeah, I'm really looking for a piece of jewelry to wear with something that I'm we're on my date next week. So I'm, I'm wearing a dress and you know, I'm, I really like this guy or whatever. And I want to find some cool earrings to make me look beautiful or like enhance my features. So you can start suggestive selling, which is the next step <laughs> and showing her pieces that might look good with whatever it is that she's looking for. I mean, someone might not give you that much information, but you can also, you know, just listen to what listen to what they're saying. There might be other things, other cues that you can pick up on. You can also start to like reiterate what they're saying. So if it's like, oh yeah, you know, like I really love light and airy jewelry. Yeah. Oh yeah. My jewelry is like really light and airy. I, I think you might really like some of these pieces over here or whatever without getting too pushy. And it's not really about being pushy, but it's about finding a way to kind of segue into showing them more in a way that feels natural and easy for you. So think about how you can practice. I think this is really important. Practice listening, practice suggestive selling, show them how it works, workshop on this, and then, you know, make sure that you encourage them to to try it on and have a connection with whatever you're doing through conversation. So I think those are some great tips that you can learn to get a little bit more natural about having sales conversation and starting to convert looky lose into buyers, whether you're meeting them in person, whether you're meeting them at networking events, whether you're meeting them at these live sort of trunk shows or live events that you're working at or a trade show and keep your energy up and start engaging in thoughtful conversation. That's the first start. And that's like the best way to kind of get people to fall in love with you. So a couple of weeks ago, Robin posted in one of our groups, this great this great uh, video by Chelsea Handler, which is so cool. I loved it so much. But basically, one of the things that she said is that you have something that no one else has. That was basically the, the quote that came out of it. She was telling a story about how she had been working really hard to get this comedy part, and she lost out to one of her really close friends who had only been doing it for like a month. And she was devastated and jealous and felt really bad. And even though she was really happy for her, you know, she got on the phone with her sister and her sister said to her, you know, Chelsea, you have something that no one else else has. And you have to remember that, that when you're selling, like you are special, like what you're doing matters and you have something that no one else has and that no one else can bring to the table in the jewelry world. So I wanted to end you with that. Remember that. And when you're selling, like try to just comfortably, you know, communicate what it is that you have that no one else has and share that with the world. So I'm curious to see how this helps you convert some of those looky loos into buyers at some of the live events that you're doing and in-person events. We're going to be having more sales series coming up. Robin and I are really dedicated to helping you grow your business. So stay tuned for more episodes on that. We're having just a blast bringing you this podcast. It's super fun. 
So I mentioned earlier in the podcast that we are having a live event in a couple of weeks. You can go check that out over at flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash live. We would love for you to join us in New York, September 22nd and 23rd. We have some really amazing speakers and some amazing workshops happening that day. So basically what we try to do at our live events is make them really interactive and to help you leave with tools that you can actually put into your business the next day. And beyond the amazing speakers that we have, I'm not gonna list them out all right here because it would take me probably another 10 minutes because I would start showering so much affection and love on them. I'm just gonna tell you a little bit more about some of the cool stuff that we do. So we have a couple of keynote talks and then we also are doing like live breakout sessions and workshops. We're actually gonna be workshopping with designers on things like PR pitches, about presentation skills to presenting to sales reps and about sales actually. We're gonna be workshopping with some designers and helping them refine and get more comfortable with their sales skills. And then on top of that, we're gonna be having panels both days experts who are going to come in and answer Q&A and questions about the jewelry industry. The first day is going to be more sales and marketing focused, and the second day is going to be more business focused and uh, focused on the back end side of the business. So anyway, we hope that you will join us if you're interested. Stay tuned and you can check out more information by going over to flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash live. All right. Thanks so much for listening today. It's been so fun reading some of your ratings and reviews. In fact, I got a kick. I was like going through them again today uh, before I recorded this podcast and someone gave us a review that I say excited too much. So I'm trying not to say that I'm excited every five seconds. So (laughs) if you notice that I've toned down the excitement level on saying I'm excited, that's why. Anyway, we would uh, love for you to tell us a little bit more about what you think about the podcast. So if you're interested, please pop on over to flourishthriveacademy.com forward slash iTunes. Give us a little rating and review. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you love. And if there's anything that you think that we can improve, like saying like someone thought I could improve, not saying I'm excited so much, please, please tell us because that's really helpful. It helps us create better content for you. Alrighty, you guys have an awesome day. And until next time, this is Tracy Matthews signing off.